turned up the fire, threw them into the fiery furnace. After they were in the fiery furnace, we see a fourth individual show up, and then Nebuchadnezzar shouts, come on out of that fiery furnace. So they came out of the fiery furnace with their hair unstitched, with no fire. They didn't, the Bible says that they didn't even smell like smoke. So they come out of the furnace, and then Nebuchadnezzar gets all hyped, and he says, look, your God is crazy amazing. Right? He said, look, your God is dope. <laughs> Whatever they doing, y'all leave them alone. Right? But can I offer to you that from the very beginning of this story, King Nebuchadnezzar had it wrong. Let me break it down and make it plain. King Nebuchadnezzar, in the beginning and the context of this story, thought that he was talking to men by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But in fact, these men's real name was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. If you would stay with me for a moment, the king thought that he knew who he was talking to. He called them by the name that he knew them to be. Can I offer to somebody just because somebody calls your name that doesn't know that they know who you are? Allow me to share with you that their names were changed because of the environment they were in. But although, although their names were changed and they were known by another name, they didn't allow the name given to them to define who they were. Can I offer to you that their names were changed because of the environment, but they still knew what their identity was. That he provides a perspective. The three Hebrew boys were being addressed by the most powerful living person ever in life to exist. And he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they say, you're not talking to me. <laughs> Can I offer to you that they did not let the king's perspective change their identity? Can I offer to somebody that the same is applicable to us today? Allow me to suggest to you that even today, when the enemy or the devil attacks, he always has a perspective of us that is inaccurate. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with me, let me make it plain. When the enemy attacks you, dear sister, he thinks that he's attacking just another woman with a messed up childhood and self-esteem issues, but he's really attacking God's divinely and perfectly created us. Come on here, man. Brother, the enemy thinks that he's attacking just another no good, ain't no good man, but he's really attacking a kingdom man with authority that is divine and a divine destiny. I see I'm going to have to preach this thing to myself. I'll make it personal when the enemy attacks me. When he attacks me, Orson Jr., he thinks that he's attacking me. But he's really attacking God's anointed servant. Y'all yeah. are not with me yet. I'm going to continue to preach to myself when the enemy attacks us collectively. When he attacks us collectively as a movement. We think that he thinks that he's attacking feast. But he doesn't realize that he's attacking a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a generation of young adults who are understanding of the goodness, mercy, and glory of the true and living God. We are in God's perfect will. He does not understand that he's attacking a generation that said, yes, God, I love you, God. Yes, God, I'm a young adult. Yes, God, a lot of people don't get me. Yes, God, I was uniquely made. Yes, God, I've had some struggles. Yes, God, I've had some weaknesses. Yes, God, this world is crazy. Yes, God, there's darkness all around me. Yes, God, there's trouble on every side. Yes, God, I will admit that the enemy has come in like a flood. But the Lord will. Come on, look to your neighbor and say the Lord will. The Lord will. He will lift up a standard against him. Against him, the devil doesn't know who he's been talking to. Come on, look to your neighbor and shake your head with an attitude and tell them the enemy don't know who he's talking to. 
Now, I offer to you that he has no idea what your identity is in Jesus Christ. Can I offer to you that you should be excited to be in this place with fellow believers? Just say, I'm going to change. And I'm a young adult. And I will put God before everything. And he is my priority. And when God leads me to worship, that's what I'm going to do. And I won't apologize for being who God has divinely created me to be. Come on, make me happy and say, thank God I'm peace. There are four principles that we need to consider in the context of this scripture. That Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah exuded. Go to verse 16. Beginning of the verse is a statement. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Can I offer to you that the first principle that we see here in this initial statement is that God is able be, and we know that God is able because they said it. And if them saying that God is able lets us know that they had an understanding of who God is. Right. Point number one, he understood. They understand who God is. Won't you write that down, text yourself, put it on Instagram because you're going to need this. They knew who God, who God was. When they were faced with either choosing to fall down and worship the image or death by a fiery furnace, they chose to respond with a statement declaring their understanding. It is so important that we as believers have an understanding of who God is because when we know who God is, we also know what God is capable of. When we truly know who God is, we know what God is capable of doing. We know that that, that, that is a fact that God is all-powerful and all-knowing. We must understand that the same God that had the power to create the heavens and the stars and the moon and the earth and the seas and the oceans and the rivers is the very same God that has the ability and the power to change our circumstances. We must know that our God is so big that he can do anything. Somebody shout, our God is big. Our God is big. The second thing that we find here is they give a statement of faith. They say, he will. After they say, uh, uh, we know that my God is able. After they understand who God is and what God is capable of doing. The second thing they do is they, they, they give this statement of faith. They say, uh, 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 they say that he is able and he will. Point number two is we must be willing to walk in our faith. After understanding who God is and what he's capable of, they choose in continuation of their understanding. They declare this statement, and God will deliver us out of thine hand. That is a statement of faith. Can I offer to you that they choose to adjoin a statement of faith with their understanding of who God is, and they say God is able, and he will deliver us out of thy enemy's hand. i got to stay right here for a moment because this portion is so critical for us to understand because we as Christians, uh, we not only need this understanding, but we need our understanding to be adjoined with our faith. Yeah. Too often we, we take what we, what we uh, uh, understand and we separate that from our faith. I wish I had some time to stay right here. I don't. So ask your pastors about this. We find that there's a state of understanding. And then there's a state of walking in, in your faith and having faith. When we join these two things together, that is when we begin the process of spiritually walking with God. It is only when we take our understanding and our faith that we truly walk with God. Am I in the house tonight? Can I offer it to you? But that's not all. That's not all. But the next statement is so essential. They say that they just don't walk in their faith, but they also do something additional. They say, but if not. Look to your neighbor and say, but if not. But if not. Be it known that we will not serve thy gods, 
or worship the golden image. Can I offer to you that the third statement they make is a statement of declaration. The third principle is you must stand in what you believe. We find that this statement of declaration, we can spiritually denote that God does not only want us to understand and have faith, but he also wants us after we understand and after we walk, he wants us to stand. They stood understanding, walking, and knowing that, that, that what they believed in is greater than themselves. They knew that even if God didn't grant them the grace to get out of the situation, that God was still God and he was still in control of their lives and their circumstances. They knew that even if God doesn't do what we think that he's supposed to do or we believe he's supposed to do, they remain unwavered in their stance and belief in God. For many of us, we've got to get this point. Some of us, if that was us, at this point, we would begin to question God. Yeah. But in that moment, they acknowledge that even if they don't see the promise of God manifest in their life, they knew that the promise of God was real. Yeah. What happens when you believe the promise? But nothing in your life has the promise of his promise. What do you do when God has promised you something and you stood? But then something happens after you stand. <laughs> so I had time to stay right there. I wish I had time. But understand, they had their understanding. They walked in their understanding and after they walked, they stood with this statement of declaration and said, but even if God doesn't do it, we still will not serve your gods. Look to your neighbor and say, stand for what you believe in. We find that in consideration in this response of the three Hebrew boys, we find that in verses 17 and 18, though the Hebrew boys had an understanding, they had enough faith to walk, and they made their statement of declaration, and they stood in it how we find that after all of those things happened, that did not stop the enemy from throwing them in the fire and furnace. <laughs> Who officer had some help in here? That did not stop the enemy whoo, from throwing them into the fiery furnace. That we find the fact that even after they remained and they stood and they began exuding principles one through three, they still had to experience some fire in their life. Can I offer to you that in this exact place of scripture, that's where many 21st centuries fall. We have done everything that we can't do. we tried everything that God has asked us to do. We have attempted to live lives that are pleasing to God. We have tried with all of our might and all of our efforts to do the right thing before God and we still experience some fire. And once the fire hits, can I offer to you that most of us return to being the people that we used to be. We return to being the, and living the lives that we used to live without care or regard for God whatsoever. Just because we tried real hard and we experienced some fire in our life, we turned our back on God. Let me say it a different way. Too many of us feel like just because we're giving a little effort that that should be enough. I don't know who I'm talking to and I really don't care, but I'm talking to somebody in here that because there are people in here who've given everything that they can. They've tried everything that they know. They believed everything and they were still thrown in the fire and they stopped believing. We've been thrown in the fire and then we no longer understand we've been thrown in the fire. And then we no longer have faith. We've been thrown in the fire. And we stop standing for what we believe in. We've been thrown in the fire. And we've allowed the flames to consume our hope. And I offer to you that if you only exude principles one through three, then you turn away from God. 
I describe that as an individual who has mastered the art of bluffing. Let's consider the text so much out here. We're saying, my God is able and he will deliver us. And if he does not deliver us, we will not serve your God in the moment that the enemy says, well, if you won't serve my God, then I'm going to turn the temperature up seven times what it normally or has ever been. Can I offer to you that for some of us, that's when we start negotiating with the king on the side. The moment the king says, we're going to find it, you want to act like that? You want to stand in what you believe? Turn the fire up seven times. Can I offer to you that some of y'all would have in here would have began negotiating with the enemy? Yeah. Can I offer to you that too many of us are looking to bluff the devil? <laughs> too many of us are looking to bluff the devil. And then when the fire is turned up, we look at that same devil and want to negotiate. Come on, help me preach this day and ask them, are you negotiating with the enemy? Let's be about it. You know why talking? I'm gonna try again. If you don't talk, I'm gonna come to your row. Look to your neighbor and ask them, "Are you negotiating with the devil?" Oh, y'all see they say it loud enough. Men who are married and in relationships and say that they're committed to their wives, are you negotiating with the devil by going to the store and flirting with the cashier? I wish I had some help. In here, women, what you smiling at? Women, you say that you want a healthy relationship, but are you negotiating with the devil by watching the real housewives? Oh, 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 oh. Are, we are you negotiating with the devil by watching love and hip hop at now? Or do I wish I had some real food in here tonight? Look to your neighbor and ask them, are you negotiating with the devil? Are you negotiating with the devil? I've got to get out of here. I've stayed too long now. But I offer to you that, that I find it interesting that this this writer in the 23rd verse, he uses this term fall, says that they fell into the blazing furnace. They fell down. I need you to get this portion out. The 23rd verse says that they were bound and they were tied up and they failed. They followed God with everything that they had. They didn't negotiate with the enemy. They didn't negotiate with the devil. And the moment they get inside the fiery furnace, the Bible says they fail. I know that this is a strong consideration that most times we miss, but can I offer to you that in the context of this third chapter of Daniel, falling down is consistent and an attribute attached to worship. In six different scriptures in this third chapter of Daniel, we find that King Nebuchadnezzar says, when the trumpets blow, when the musicians start playing, I want you to fall down and worship the golden image. Six different times can I offer to you that falling down to the ground, it symbolized the ultimate sign of worship. Falling down symbolizes the ultimate sign of worship. I find it interesting that they did not fall down when commanded by the king. They didn't fall down when the king threatened them and said, fall down. But the moment that they enter the furnace, we see that they fail. We say it a different way. They did not fall down because of the desires of the king. But they fell down in the divine will of God. They did not 
not fall down when the king commanded. But they fell down while going into the fiery furnace. Can I offer to you that when I give God all that I have, and I still find that there is fire in my life. Yeah. And perhaps in some way I have fallen. I can be encouraged and know that I am in this fire. And my falling is okay. Because I'm in the divine will of God. Yeah. Look to your neighbor and say, if I fall, if I fall I'm in his will. God. I wish I had some help in here. I wish somebody knew 
I wish somebody knew that when I experience the presence of God, it's just not an experience. I just don't feel happy. Because I know that wherever the presence of God is, his glory is also. So even if I'm in the fire, I can walk around happy with joy. Because I know that with God, his glory is with me even in the fire. I wish I had some help in here tonight. If you know that even if you're walking in the fire, that God's glory is walking with you. If you're walking in the fire, you, you, you know that God's glory and his presence is with you. But the only way you experience God's glory and his presence is through worship. I know this is not popular, but I don't care. The most precious time in your life is the time that you spend with God. Young adults, if we get this principle now, can I offer to you that we never have to live another day without his presence. Yeah. We never have to live another day without his glory. We never have to live another day without him leading and walking with us even if we find ourselves in, Amen. in the fire. Amen. Impossible. Or not. Will you face the impossible? Or not? Why won't you come on and sing? Impossible. Look to your neighbor and say, impossible. impossible. Look to your other neighbor and just let them know if they don't know that God has the impossible for you. He has the impossible for you. We're going to get out of here. We've stayed a long time now. But in this moment, we just want to begin to worship God and we're going to worship God in our way the young adult way we have feast members all over the building the feast members can stand all over the building if all of you guys can stand all over the building we want to just go out for those, our feast prayers the feast people that pray Prayer warriors, won't you go out to the congregation and group up and grab hands? We want to pray. We're not going to come down to the altar, but we're going to come to you and we're going to pray with you. We're going to pray corporately together. Come on, won't you stand? We're going to end this in prayer. Come on, grab your neighbor's hand. Feast members, you say, go ahead and begin praying.
know, turn up for Jesus and shine our light and make those people in the world uncomfortable because we're taking the presence and the spirit and the glory of the living God. Yeah.